It's Friday, June the 12th, 2020, just after market close here on the East Coast in the United States. This is the Real Vision Daily Briefing. I'm Ed Harrison here in the Washington, D.C. area. I'm going to be joined shortly by Raul Powell, who is our co-founder and CEO. But first, the market update by Jack Farley. Thanks, Ed. Markets were relatively tranquil today, with the price action in European equities being muted and U.S. stocks inching higher alongside EMFX and commodities. Meanwhile, the U.S. yield curve showed some bear steepening. But investors are still reeling from yesterday's massive crash, and they're left wondering, was yesterday just folks taking some money off the table, or was the sell-off an omen that the drastic swings of March will return? Ed shared a fascinating note from Charlie McElliott of Nomura, who attributed the sell-off to some turbulence in the vol space. He noticed that the biggest drawdowns in March are passing the three-month window in hindsight, and he argued that this induced tactical discretionary traders as well as some market makers in derivatives, to take some money off the table and do some delta hedging because the models that they rely on to target vol have a soft cutoff at the three-month mark. So that's the technical factor to keep in mind. And that's why we saw the VIX skyrocket higher and vol of vol positively exploded, reaching the seventh highest vol of vol on record. McElliott notes that retail traders were hit hard yesterday with the retail favorites index he created down 16% over Wednesday and Thursday combined. But the speculative fervor in bankrupt stocks like Hertz continued today, which was up 40% as of the time of this filming. The bondholders in Hertz capitalized on this speculative fervor last night, announcing that they would offer additional shares of equity. Remember, they've already declared bankruptcy. It's evident that they're trying to recoup as much of their losses as they can. So these debt holders are out to capture the over $400 million in market cap still out there before the doomed equity capital rots on the vine. So there you have two possible narratives for yesterday's blowout. There's the technical narrative where players in the derivatives markets did some spring cleaning. And then there's the retail narrative where retail traders who have been bidding up highly speculative companies are coming up against financial reality. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ed and Raul. Great update, Jack. Uh, Raul, a lot of stuff to go through that Jack was talking about in terms of volatilities in the market yesterday. We started off today. Actually, I'm actually uh, surprised that we didn't see more of a snapback today, compared given how much of a sell-off we had yesterday. I mean, it seems like we're in a phase shift right now in terms of the market. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Look, it was interesting when I woke up this morning at whatever five o'clock in Cayman, uh, checked the markets. They're up two percent, two point two percent the S and P, and then most of the day it was trading negative. Uh, you know, I saw the dollar roll over right at the top of the range in the euro, an area that I've been looking at. Uh, bonds went straight back down to yield lows again. And like you, I'm getting the sense that we might have had the shift. I've been warning people for a period of time, you know, at those three phases that I had as my basic hypothesis that it would be the liquidation phase finished in March, then the hope phase should finish in June. And then we should roll into what I call the insolvency phase. So I've been on the red alert for that. And then, you know, not that I nailed the timing to the day and expected yesterday to happen. But it was interesting to me to like you and many others who have been looking at this thinking, yeah, there's too big a disconnect between what we think is going on versus what the markets are saying. And the bond markets weren't really agreeing with the equity markets. And that's always a flashing sign to me. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, when you look at uh, high yield, when you look at uh, the uh, t- treasury markets, there's a, there was definitely a disconnect there. I'm I'm just trying to to frame it in a in a different way in, t- in terms of thinking about it. I think two videos actually that we had on the platform uh, this week really highlight kind of the macro view, both from an economic and and and. Uh, uh, policy perspective, and also from a, a historical perspective. Uh, I'm thinking about Mark Cuban, which I believe was on uh, Tuesday, and then uh, Neil Ferguson, which came out uh, today. And I, I want to talk to you a little bit about their perspective. I thought Mark Cuban's, his comparison to 1999 was very interesting. Um, initially, I really thought it was overwrought. Uh, but then when I started seeing all the stuff with Hertz, with uh, Chesapeake Energy, I thought, you know, this is some crazy stuff. This whole thing 
has been like a blend of everything we've ever seen and also like nothing we've ever seen. You know, it's it's a blend of 1929, it's a blend of the Nikkei 1990, the S&P 2001, the S&P 2008. It's part of the Eurozone crisis and now it's like 1999 thrown in the middle of a crisis. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the, the retail extravagance was truly extraordinary in the middle of what's going on. I mean, we've never, literally, we've never seen anything like this before. So it, it, it's, it smells of everything, but it's definitely a unique dish we're being served. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, like, for instance, if you had gone back, if someone uh, teleported you back a month ago, in your wildest dreams, would you think that, you know, retail investors were driving up bankrupt stocks in the middle of, you know, which is basically 20% unemployment. And, you know, I know we get a bit of flack in the comments section over this, but, you know, the, if you analyze the flows, a lot of the flows were the retail guys spending their checks plus the 401k money going into index funds by the same group of millennials who are all at home, who've all essentially saved money over this period and have used it and it's gone into the market. So not only was their 401k money going in, but then the excess savings, the check they were given, many of it went into the market. I mean, millions of brokerage accounts opened across America over that period of time. And, you know, Dave Portnoy, or whatever his name is, from Barstool Sports, has now become the cheerleader of that movement. And half of us think it's satire, and half of us think it's, it's kind of a little bit real to the truth. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's a little bit like Ali G or something like that, where you, you just don't know if it's satire or not. Right. I love that. I mean, I did the the, uh, the videos of him when he's like uh, taking on Buffett. I think are really hilarious. I have to say that I, I get a kick out of the guy, uh, and I do not know if he's kidding uh, or if he's like, yes, I, okay, let me just ham it up a little bit here. Yeah, I I, I really don't know. I kind of think he's serious but also hamming it up because he knows how to entertain a crowd. But, I, you know, I think there's a lot of people who've done what he's done. It's like, I'm stuck at home. There's no sports on. I've got nothing else to do, and I've got a bit of extra cash. I'm going to see if I can make some money in the market. And, you know, Howard Lindzen raised a point on Twitter, and um, I thought it was an important point, which is we should encourage people to participate in financial markets and begin to understand them. Sadly, the journey for most of us in that is losing money first. Right. You know, if you're going to... Investing in a pension, you don't actually notice your losses because you're thinking about the next 30 years, 40 years. But trading, you know, you actually have to learn losses. So to get people actively involved in financial markets is a good thing. In the middle of a pandemic, maybe not the best thing. <laughs> no, certainly not. And, you know, um, in terms of the madness of crowds, uh, you're, you're a macro guy. And ultimately, what it means is, is, is that fundamentals do matter. At the end of the day, the madness of crowds can only last for so long. The fundamentals come back into the, into the fore. Uh, the way that I've been looking at this is as a reopening rally. That is, is, is that what's happened is, is, is that we've been able to reopen. I would say if you look at the trajectory of China, we, were, we reopened relatively quickly compared to what people might have thought, say, in March or April. That is, it took China from front to back from the, uh, two months of closure. And if you look at Europe and the United States, we've done, relatively speaking, pretty much the same thing, perhaps more aggressively. And I think people on the back of that uh, started to think that the V-shaped recovery was the most likely outcome. Now, we uh, are, on the, are, on, are starting to come onto the back side of that. And I think that's, this is where the Neil Ferguson interview comes into play for me, because the revelation in that interview, and I thought it was a great interview in terms of the, uh, the history, you know, when he was talking about 1968 and Richard Nixon and so forth, the revelation for me actually was the viral part, when he was talking about viral science. And the way that it seemed to me was almost like he was saying, look, pandemics, we know they go on for six to 18 months. There's not going to be a, 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 an antidote, so to speak, uh, coming anytime soon. Yeah, so I was actually luckily on a call with Neil with a very small select group and um, somebody that Neil knows from Imperial College um, London talking about vaccines because he was the developer of vaccines and he's an advisor to Neil, I believe. Uh, so we were talking yesterday about exactly this. 
And it struck me, firstly, that Neil had gone and spoken to all of the professors who have studied pandemics, even back to Roman times. And his idea is that generally pandemics stick around for two years. So we've got that to deal with. But the virus expert, super interesting, because he just basically flat out said there is zero chance of a virus, of a vaccine this year. He's like, there is, nobody's tested enough on, uh, you know, the, the testing has been on like 10 people maximum. There's no proper studies. The efficacy is not there. Then when we study the virus itself, we don't know even antibodies, how they interact with the virus. So, you know, Mayo uh, Clinic has the maximum number of antibodies. They've been doing the analysis on it. They can't get the correlations to work. Nobody understands the protein structure outside of the spikes where everyone's been studying it. That the picture you see on of the COVID virus, of the spikes. Nobody's studied the body. There's not a single paper on that, apparently. Um, they don't know. They know it's mutating. They know it's mutating slowly. The point being, as the guy said, we really don't know anything. He said, on the good side, there's a lot of people working on this. On the bad side, and Neil mentioned it, is governments are kind of understanding that this is not coming. And it's not coming in any meaningful way for a year. And therefore, they're going to lie, probably. Right. And, and you know, uh, I so mean, they will try. They will try that PR kill. We've already seen that with the with the White House making these kind of ridiculous statements about stuff. And it's it's all about the feel good factor. And sometimes that backfires. Do you think that they're going to make it to the election uh, before a second wave has a, a meaningful oh. impact? Oh, no, no, no. I, I do the maths on all of this all the time. I mean. We are already picking up uh, in Texas, um, Arizona, Florida, North Carolina, California is still bad. Um, the, you see the numbers in the United States, they've just hit new highs, but it looks relatively flat. Well, it's only flat because New York and the Northeast Coast has collapsed. The rest is doing this. This bit overtakes that bit very shortly as this bit goes to zero or close to it we're going to see a dramatic rise coming out. So even if we look at the forward projections of the current rate of change, you know, we've got new massive all-time highs coming in the US within the second week of July. So no, I, I think we're in a, um, and I, I talked about this a lot on the um, Macro Insiders um, Real Vision Pro update I put out today. Um, I think we're coming into a window of vulnerability where we're going to get bad virus news, no fiscal fiscal stimulus rolling off, these kind of people at home with checks, well, half of them are going back to work and they're not going to be punting the stock market and the other half are going to have no checks and going to be at home without a job. Um, so that dries up 401k flows. That's a big issue. That's happening globally. We've got a whole bunch of issues from the Federal Reserve balance sheet rates of change slowing down to the Treasury stepping up bond issuance, which is going to take liquidity out. All of this globally is all happening between now and September. So we've got a, a kind of scary window coming up. And I think the virus one is the one that could be the icing on the cake. Now, I don't expect full lockdowns, but there might be. I mean, there's a risk that Houston's going to have to lock down. Right. But the mayor of Houston saying, look, it's out of control already. And... They're going to have to make a decision at some point what to do. You know, I've been saying that I think that, you know, uh, because the initial lockdown was so draconianly negative for the economy, that uh, it's only in a pinpointed way that we're going to ever go back to what we saw then. And, and so when you talk about Houston, yes, OK, so we can do that. But I feel as if uh, that, you know, that the reason that we came out of lockdown so quickly in the U.S. was because it was so negative for the economy. But and so it's almost as if we'll, we'll never go back to that. Uh, do, what do you think of that? Do you think that there's any chance that we could see widespread lockdowns again uh, in 2020-21? I think it'll be and I said this from the beginning, it'll be sporadic lockdowns of certain areas. And that'll be global and it'll be ongoing. But it, again, we need to not follow the red herring. The actual thing is here is, is if certain cities lock down, it creates a behavioral change at the margin for the entire population. 
And that's what really drives consumer behavior and business behavior. So, you know, I think a situation of rolling lockdown just keeps the year on year GDP growth well below zero and drives that risk of the kind of solvency events and a long standing recession. I mean, basically, most recessions are around two years. So I think it would be a bloody miracle to expect this one to be less. Right. Yeah. And, and let me just say that uh, the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is relative value plays. Uh, I, I was thinking immediately I was uh, uh, this uh, Munich um, Hofboy Keller uh, opened up uh, maybe a week or two ago because they had the, uh, the lockdown relaxation. Literally one week later, they closed. Why? No business. This is in Germany. This is a harbinger of what we're talking about. And so then you say to yourself, what does that mean in terms of, you know, relative value plays? What does it mean in terms of the the cycle that you're talking about, the insolvency cycle? I think it means that you have greater insolvencies. And as a result of that, it means that you're going to have, um, you know, sectoral relative value plays. It means you're going to have asset class relative value plays. And in particular, I think about high yield versus um, uh, versus uh, investment grade debt. And, and the other way I've been doing a lot of work in GMI is not only looking at high yield versus investment grade, because the problem is we've got the elephant in the room, which is the Fed. Right. And the market kind of doesn't know how to price the Fed being in the credit markets. But I tell you what will do, and that's the equity market. So I think and I've looked at the triple B equities a massively underperforming triple B credit. Because we've seen this in the European banks, right? Because the European banks are essentially the credit supported by the ECB and, um, and the member states. But the equity's on its way to zero and has been for a long time. And I think the same thing is playing out here where the equity becomes the portion that is trading freely still. And so we, we might see these triple B. So yes, I agree, there's all sorts of relative value interesting things and dislocations, you know, where this is going to go and how this is going to play out. You know, when you mention European banks, I think this is part of Roger's thesis that he's always talking about, that there's sort of a canary in the coal mine. I was looking at some of the data. I was looking at uh, Spanish banks, as an example. And, you know, B BBVA and um, uh, Santander, neither of those two have ex excessive exposure to the hospitality sector, as an example, or to small and medium-sized businesses. I think they have like 10% exposure yeah. versus 60% to the property sector back in you know the sovereign debt. Yes, process. but those guys switched the property for Latin America. Who's got the virus problem? Latin America. Who owns a huge amount of the $12 trillion of corporate debt? Brazil. Where's Santander and B BBVA? Brazil. <laughs> right. So, you know, European banks are brilliant at getting into trouble, right? <laughs> they, they, they sniff it out. And uh, so they've switched domestic risk for international risk just at the wrong time. Right. Very interesting. That is a very interesting uh, point to point out. And my next point was that, uh, let's say that actually that there is risk that we're not looking at and it materializes and you just pointed out one of those risks what does that mean in terms of policy responses because i've been looking at uh there's a bubbling up of this concept of a bad bank is it possible uh, just using this as an example the europeans that the europeans uh, uh that we go even further in terms of the policy responses See, from I, yeah ed I, you know i don't know because a bad bank is great when you've got a property bust, right? You sweep all that shit under the rug, you put it over there, let it stink in the corner, and we pretend it doesn't happen, right? But if anybody can actually put their finger on what's wrong with the European banks, I'd be amazed. We don't know, really. They just trade terribly. And there's something wrong. And you know, a lot of people say, well, there's no problems now. You know, they've got the cocos, blah, blah, blah. Well, none of that worked. Every time everybody says there's something right, the share price says, no, 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 there's something very wrong here, and you can smell it. There's a rotting carcass lying everywhere, whether it's in Italy, Spain, the French banks, the German banks, and nobody can put their finger on it. So where do you get the bad bank? What do you put into it? So my view is it's all bad, and it needs to be nationalized. That, yeah. you know, and 
that would be a, the complete unwind of the whole 1980s financialization of the entire European economy going back to, and that kind of plays into that Richard Warner interview, Richard right. Werner interview, because Richard said, and I didn't agree with a lot of what he said in different ways, but I think his ideas played with some of my ideas very well as well. He's like, basically, the central banks will become the banks. Right. The, the only lender. And, you know, by the time you introduced digital currency, there was a fantastic interview I did today with an, uh, the, the brilliance of Twitter. I met a guy on Twitter, Santiago Velez. Never met him before, never spoken to him. I could tell he was crazy smart and knew everything about the digital asset space. So I got him on Real Vision and he blew me away. But he also helped me understand that how basically with the digital currency revolution, we don't need banks. The central bank can, and governments essentially don't even need central banks by the end of it. So it's a really interesting point that maybe all these banks should be nationalized and got rid of. Right. But, you know, and that works, obviously, in the first world, in, uh, you know, Europe and places like the United States. But what do you do if you are in a country where you're not even close to a reserve currency and you have the same sort of problems with corporate debt uh, that uh, a lot of other countries have? Do you then try to nationalize, you know, uh, basically socialize the losses onto the central bank, onto the government's balance sheet? What does that mean for emerging markets? What does it mean for emerging market currencies well, and inflation? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm, it, it all depends on the dollar, right? If the dollar goes up, then everybody gets wiped out. If the dollar goes down, everyone gets to live another day. So, you know, the whole dollar argument, I think we've got this a great piece with Brent Johnson and, uh, and Lynn Olden coming up. Right. Um, which is the debate about the dollar, and it's a very valid debate. Uh, you know, I'm very strongly in the strong dollar camp. If that does happen and the dollar goes up, well, we've got a bunch of knock-on effects. Firstly, emerging markets get splatted again. Um, they've got COVID going on as well. So what they're going to have to do is they're going to lose all their cash flows from their corporates and, they're gonna, and, and they've got the domestic cash flows gone. So it's going to go onto the central bank balance sheet. Uh, no, the, um, the government balance sheet. Right. Because well, they can't print money without destroying their own currency. It becomes the United States and the G20's problem. <laughs> What's interesting there is they don't have much money either because they've just expanded their balance sheets by 30%. You know, I don't know what the natural limit of all of this is. Some people would argue there's no limit. We're going to find out. In the next three years, we're going to find out what, whether there are limits. Right. And, you know, that was, to me, the, the crucial tension in the interview between Hugh Hendry and uh, Richard Werner, that basically it sounded over and over like Hugh was like, how far can they go? Can they prop up the market forever? Can't they just, you know, continue? This, this is where we are. This is the paradigm that we're, got, we're about to find got out. Some you've got some views on this. You've spent some time looking around the MMT world. What, what do you think? I, I think that uh, the Chinese are the closest to um, giving us an understanding of how this really works in terms of law socialization. It's really about coercion of will. That is, it, it, let's let's put it in the MMT terms for a second. That is, is is that the 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 coercion of the state really is all about the ability to tax in in the currency that they create. They force you to have a debt obligation to them in the form of a tax. And that means you must have their money. Their money is necessary for that. They can therefore then use that in order to make what was private money, bank money, state money. And th that's sort of a pyramid where they're at the top of that pyramid. And so they can socialize any losses in the private sector from the, the, the larger amount to the degree that they want to. The question is, is what is the political backlash? And so in China, where it's a, it's a um, you know, it's, it's a totalitarian state, there is no political backlash. So they can socialize all the losses that they want. You know, they can do the financial repression. They can keep uh, interest rates down. They can, uh, you know, make whole on these uh, state lenders. And, it, and they can just continue to do that. So people who are looking for China to fall down, we, I, was, I was having a conversation uh, ab about this with um, uh, Mike uh, Mike Howe, 
And his view is, is, is that basically people, they need to wake up to the concept that the, the Chinese can continue to do this for a long, much longer period than they think. I think that the weakest link in the United States and in Western Europe in particular is the political link. And we see that uh, with Germans, uh, uh, for example. Uh, you know, I was looking at uh, what's going on with uh, the retail sector in Germany. You know, these uh, people who work at some of these bankrupt retailers, they're hopping mad. They're like, you know, we, we spent our life with you. Uh, you promised us a job and now you're throwing us out in the street. Are the Germans then gonna give money to the Italians and the Spanish to help bail them out because of COVID-19? When these people who were working at Kaufhof and uh, you know uh, Kostadt are on the streets, penniless? I don't think so. So I think that you have a political problem right there. That's where the problem starts. It's very much a political economic problem. And my view of the MMT thing is, Sure, maybe it works, but the currency will fall. Right. My view of MMT generally, and again, I've not spent massive amounts of time, but generally speaking, it's not a closed system. Even China's not a closed system, and you saw massive capital flight. Now, China has an added problem is that there's several trillion of US dollar debt. So that's a complication, because it's all right if it's all RMB debt, Sure, money's going to leak out and it creates a problem for your currency. But if you've got dollar debt as well, so I, you know, I'm not sure whether they can get away scot free. Right. It's, hey, it's, you know, the, the MMTers are onto that. Uh, they always talk about the currency as the release valve. That yeah. is, is you know, you have the fiscal uh, freedom, you have the uh, monetary freedom that you know, interest rates, fiscal policy deficits, and then you have the the currency. Uh, you know, when people talk about the difference between the JGBs and the U.S. dollar, that the U.S. is a debtor nation and the uh, the Japanese, they own all of their JGBs. So what? The currency falls then. And and then what what does that mean? But isn't that so when we say so what the currency falls, it depends how much it falls and what does that mean to the value of the assets of that country? So, you know. If the currency moves 30%, who cares, right? You know, everyone has a, a, a bear market in their currencies from time to time. But if it falls 60%, it starts to become a problem because it's inflationary, it lowers the value of your assets, and lowers the amount of investment. So currency is not meaningful until it really is meaningful. Again, so it, it just depends. Like, dollar yen can go to 115 and nobody cares. It goes to 200 and it's everybody's problem. Right. Yes. Just like when it went to, I think it was, uh, it went to 80. Uh, <laughs> yeah. In 1998, 99. Exactly. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with a, a lot of uncertainty. I think a lot of it is policy uncertainty. A lot of it is viral uncertainty. And these are things that we're not really comfortable with. And I think that it's going to create some volatility. How do you, how are you thinking about this particular phase shift in time that we're speaking to right now? If we, you know, before we wrap this all up today, uh, I mean, because we don't have a crystal ball, obviously. No, and so, you know, I use a bit of a probability to just give people an idea, a sense of how strong my view is. So I'm kind of thinking it's a 60% chance the top in the stock market's in. Stop, you know, I'm not trading equities right now. I don't think that's the good opportunity. I think there is a 80% chance that over the next three months that yields go to zero or negative, particularly two years, maybe five years. Um, and I think there is a decent probability, you know, more than 50% that the dollar low in this, I think it was a corrective move, mm. um, is in. So I think this whole period of time, those probabilities will probably rise. And I think every week we will get further confirmation because I think you've got the same sense. Look, we don't know for sure, but it feels like it. And if we start to see more confirmations, I think all of these probabilities go up. And I think your probabilities will go up too, that you know we're in a phase shift again to something that could be nasty. Now, could it just be a three month phase shift? Possible. Or could it be the start of something bigger? I think that's still pretty probable. And what, uh, do, you, what do you think? I, I, my last word on this is, is that, um, it, it, 
a lot of it definitely depends on things that you and I are uncomfortable uh, thinking about because they're so volatile. And that is, in the first instance, politics, and in the second instance, uh, epidemiology. You know, be, because anything could happen on those two fronts, the dispersion of possible outcomes are large. And for me, the, you know, when you, I'm thinking of it in the same framework that you are in terms of the probability of different outcomes, most of the dispersion is fat tailed to the negative side. Yeah. And that's that's where my, my, my worries lie. Yeah, with the market near all time highs, it has to have skewed all the risks net. Not all of the risks, but the majority of the risks are all to that left side now, to the to the risk side. Right. And so th that's kind of how I'm thinking of it. The the market has played itself into a corner where you know there's not a whole lot of upside, but there's a lot of downside. Yeah, I tend to agree. You know, it's it's going to be next week's actually going to be a really interesting week. You know, you, you and I were talking at the editorial meeting today about, okay, are we going to have to start really micro focusing on this shift if it comes? And we don't know yet, but you know, I think the whole team is is gearing up to say, okay, we we, we you know. We need, we'll, we'll be needing to shift the viewpoints to different things if this happens. Not a viewpoint that we have a viewpoint, but meaning, you know, do we focus on equity markets, credit, mar credit markets, or do we look for longer term themes? You know, that, because people have a need to know what's going on when things move fast. Yeah. And, and for me, I think that the, bl the biggest blind spot at this point now is what is the market that matters the most uh, to the downside? Uh, where is the risk that I'm not uh, currently aware of and that perhaps Real Vision isn't talking about right now? Is it, as an example, CLOs or is there something else that we're missing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't even, I mean, um, you know, the, again, this came up at the editorial meeting. I'm like, I don't really understand CLOs because I haven't been involved in it, you know. And But there are a few people kind of tapping us all on the shoulder saying, hey, listen, look over there, that's something pretty ugly. And yeah, you know, we, 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 we don't know, as you rightly say, you never really know where the next leg starts and what it is, but there's always something. And, you know, our job is to try and scour the world looking for the experts who have an inkling of where these kind of hand grenades may lie. Well, you know, uh, all I can say is uh, today, I'm just gonna go on my bike ride as I always do. Uh, just focus on my family, uh, try to live the, to the best I can and uh, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> exactly right, exactly right, exactly right. You know, in the end, you know, sometimes it's a bit tiring because, you know, it's a negative, there's a negative world and the macro has been biased negative for a while. You know, I, I did love, again, that conversation I had today with Santiago Velez because we were talking about everything bullish. You know, complete new worlds and, you know, and you forget that there are, there are many parallel universes going on right now, you know, it, and you need to celebrate those things and also just live your life a little bit. Um, and, you know, A, the markets aren't everything and lockdown isn't everything. There's a beautiful world out there. We just need to get out and see some of it. I think those are great words to end it on. Uh, Ra, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, you know, peace and happiness. And, and, have a, uh, and have a great weekend, Ed, and have a great weekend, everybody else as well.